Thank you very much for attending the talk today on tracking and accreditation in crypto marketing. I uh, appreciate your time. Um, <clears throat> so let me just figure out how this works. Great. So just give you a quick introduction as to who I am. Uh, my name is Jamie McCormick. I'm managing director of Bitcoin Marketing Team based in Dublin. Uh, been on the blockchain since 2013. And I've been working with blockchain clients for five years now, since 2014. Uh, in that time, we've worked on over 30 crypto projects. And these have kind of covered exchanges, betting platforms, mining pools, some payment processors, a few B2P services. And we also took part in 11 token sales that raised 110 million between them. Uh, I also lecture the business of games in Technical Technological University Dublin. And I'm a mentor with Enterprise Ireland, which is a state agency for indigenous enterprise. So uh, really just want to give a, a bit of a background as to how we got to working in crypto. So classically trained in marketing. I'm a member of the Marketing Institute of Ireland. Uh, I worked originally in the video games industry for over 12 years. So I've taken a lot of the learnings that I took from that industry into crypto. And we've been working with uh, a variety of clients, including Salt Lending, Playkey, which is a game streaming platform, Local CoinSwap, which is a P2P exchange, and Aventus, which is a ticketing platform. So quite an interesting mix of clients over the years. And uh, in managing quite a lot of budget over the years, I ended up designing a several tracking systems, including one for a video games publisher, one for a Facebook ads API company, and then a generic platform then as well. Uh, we've integrated tracking and accreditation into over 10 projects. Um, and uh, over the career, kind of, we've put about 12 million euro, which is about 13 million, 13 million dollars through that there as well. So getting that out of the way, just to really talk about why you're here. So uh, just run through a few of the different topics. So we're gonna have a look at what tracking and accreditation is, what you can measure, the importance of KPIs, uh, some of the benefits of really granularly measuring your different marketing activities, the disadvantages and costs of getting it wrong, which can be very substantial. Uh, the pitfalls of relying on Google Analytics, there are a few. Um, really look at the tracking process end to end reports uh, and how really to act on these reports, especially when you're trying to feed back into product design. Also how you can use them to measure different types of marketing activities and how you can use them to manage, optimize uh, advertising spend as well. We'll then have a quick look at some of the permutations and combinations within an advertising campaign. And then I'm gonna go through a quick case study to show you how we use the data to improve a conversion funnel. So to start off with, what's tracking? So it's a technical process for identifying the source of any particular traffic that hits your online product, and then mapping it against the performance that they have in the actual product itself. One of the key things to remember about this is you have to implement it at the start. If you do not put tracking and optimization data on your website traffic before you send it to the website, it's very, very, very difficult to try and reconcile that later on against the activities. So in terms of what you can measure, so by example, really what you're doing is if you have a thousand users hitting your website, you're segregating those users out. And then you can segment and choose where they're coming from. And generally what we see is once fully integrated, any traffic that is untagged so it doesn't have any optimization data, is really giving you your baseline of organic traffic, traffic that's driven by pure activities. And especially around pure, you can see a bump for a couple of days when there's actual pure activities going on, and that helps you track back to the actual effectiveness of that. You've got various different types of advertising activities that you can do. So these can be running across different networks. You can have multiple campaigns. You have individual traffic sources. And we'll have a look at kind of the scale of them later on. Also, when it comes to tracking the likes of social media activities, you can use this to measure the effectiveness of different platforms, different type of communications, and even track back to individual posts as well. When it comes to email marketing, whether you're doing newsletters or partnerships with different people, you can use it to measure the responses to different emails, different elements within it, whether it's a logo, a text link, buttons, call to actions. If you've partnerships with individual sites, you can use it to measure this. And especially if, you, if you're doing something offline, so say at the conference here, you have a promo code at your booth, or you're you know, doing print advertising and you want to measure that as well. You can do that through promo codes. So really, if you have 1,000 users, you might have 150 who are untagged. You've got various different ones that are tagged from Google and Facebook and uh, different networks there and activities. And over time, this builds up to give you a lot of information. Now, in terms of KPIs, why are they important? 
So within the context of a conversion funnel, these are all the individual steps and every single hoop that someone has to jump through to get to your intended goal. So that could be registration, it could be product usage, it could be monetization there as well. So if you think of the 110 meter hurdles in the Olympics, you know, you want to get over the last one and then across the line and that's your monetization there as well. Sometimes you've got broken links. So for instance, in video games when I worked there, we couldn't track people who downloaded a game. But we couldn't track who'd installed the game. But we could see that they'd registered and we could see that they logged in. So if somebody's jumped through step one and step four, you can assume that they filled in the ones in between there as well. Um, so yeah, so these relate to the steps along the registration process as well. Now also, after a registration has come in, people are gonna be using the platform. People may be registering using the platform for two, three, four, or five years as well. And you can always track back to source to see where these people came from and then use that to, to guide what you're doing there as well. Uh, and again, after initial monetization as well. Now, when you're building out KPIs for your particular company, you need to really think about what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, you know, if you're trying to get people through registration, it's, uh, and I'll give you an example here of an exchange, you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. You have to find the traffic first. You have to bring them to your website. You have to get them to register an account. After that, then they have to activate an email usually. Then they probably have to log into the system. They might have to complete KYC in terms of being able to use it. Then they have to deposit funds and then they begin to trade. And it's really only when the trading is happening that they're generating the fees. They might then withdraw funds or trade or do different things. And really it's a case of getting people to come in multiple times because that's where you're gonna get your customers from. Now in terms of the benefits of measuring things very granularly, it gives you a very holistic view of all of your activities in one particular report. Especially when you've got time and effort, you can identify where time, effort, budget is being expended that isn't giving you anything back or is giving you poor traction so that you can you know, refocus your activities and your efforts there as well. Now also through the data, you can identify quite a lot of product problems in terms of choke points and we'll have a look at a case study later on to show you how that works. You can have different traffic sources that are generating registration and sales. So if you find within say a Google campaign or a crypto advertising campaign that you've got three or four traffic sources that are generating the lion's share of your sales, you can really ring fence them and set up different campaigns just targeting them as well. Now you can also identify traffic sources that are generating no registrations and cut them out. And then you can also then use it to identify traffic sources that are generating registrations who aren't completing your funnel. So when we're working with crypto projects, we'd often see you can get a lot of people in who register, but they won't activate, they won't use the product. And when you're spending you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a month on these there as well, you don't necessarily want to be pushing that as well. Now also within the data, you can have different anomalies. And often these are gonna be an indicator of advertising fraud that's actually going on as well. So for instance, you may have 10 different traffic sources. One of them's got an incredibly high click-through rate. So your average is two, three percent, and then you have one that's 50 percent. You know, that's unusual, and the data will tell you that. If you have situations there where they're very high click-through rate and a registration, that's 90 percent. When your average is 10 percent, again, that's a flag that there's something wrong. In terms of the disadvantages of getting it wrong, firstly, it can skew your data. So it's either too good or too bad. You can fund advertising fraud, which you don't want to do, because marketing budget's a finite thing. You can use, if you get it wrong, you might be focusing time, effort, or budget on channels that actually aren't working. So this is where something seems to be too good to be true. You know, you think it's great, but then when you dig down into the data, you find out that it's actually not. On the flip side of that, you may have a campaign that looks poor, but within that, you've actually got some gems in there. So you might have 100 publishers within an advertising campaign, 98 of them are terrible, but there's two in particular that are really, really, really good. And by cutting out all of that network, you're actually cutting out two very good traffic sources because you're trying to get rid of the other ones there as well. Obviously, you can waste advertising budget. You can waste time and effort from your team. And marketing budget's usually a finite thing. You know, and if you're dumping that into a conversion funnel that's under reporting, that can waste a lot of money and time and effort. Now, when it comes to relying exclusively on Google Analytics, now, one of the most common things that we see is, is that people have registered Google Analytics, but it's not configured properly. You know, there can also be underreporting of traffic and, and leads. So for instance, we've been helping out with the advertising for SFBW, and there's a difference of about 20 to 25% between the e-commerce data in Analytics and what's in Eventbrite there as well. 
Now, there's reasons for that, script block, ad block, people using Brave. And really, one of the big issues around this is Google Analytics is sitting on top of your website. It's not in your database. And if you don't have, if you have that separation there as well, that's where there's room uh, for issues to come around. Also, if you have untagged traffic, it can really combine with the organic traffic and then your marketed traffic there as well, and it could ruin your stats. Now, in terms of the tracking process end to end, the first thing that you really need to consider is your database. You know, you have full ownership over this, you have full control over this here as well. And getting the information into that is really, really, really key. So, you know, so you need to be able to set up your database to receive data that's coming in. Next then, you have your website. So your website is gonna have data hitting it, you're gonna have you know, traffic to SFBW, and then you're gonna be adding URL parameters into that. So you need to be able to add in those links onto your website, and then you need to be able to integrate that so that the information hitting your website through links is getting fed into your database. Once you have that in place, let's skip forward here. So generally this is achieved through using URL parameters. So if anyone's familiar with uh, Google Analytics, you're probably UTM terms. This is one of the elements there as well. But you can make custom terms as well, specific for your database. And you need to use these to kind of configure what information you want to go in. Now also when it comes to URL parameters, Google Analytics by nature will strip out that information and feed the data into reports. So if you get that information and you feed it straight into your database, you can see all the data there tracked against a specific lead Six months from now, you want to say, we got a really good user that came in. Where did that user come from? Okay, he came from, or she came from the Google ad, from a particular ad word, from a particular keyword, from a particular banner on a particular day. Now, in terms of your campaign structure, you really need to have a naming convention that's there as well that makes sense to you. So if you're using Google and Facebook and CoinZilla, CoinMarketCap, any of these different websites, you need to standardize the theme that you have. So what structure are you gonna use? What UTM tags are gonna have the same information? What's gonna have the identifier of the network, the campaign, the banner that you're using, the design that you're using, and the publisher of the keyword that you have there? Now once you have that, you then have your traffic delivery. So when you have an ad server, you need to put your links in with all of this information, and often they'll use dynamic macros to on the fly add that information in. And then once you have the campaign, you can actually start measuring it then as well. So then you need to run the campaigns at enough volume to get some data through. And then that will generally uh, build into reports that you have then as well. Now once you have the reports, that's when you can start making decisions. You can see we've got 10 campaigns running concurrently. We've got four social media channels that we're putting time and effort into. Two of them are working on the social media. So for instance, Facebook usually comes up the worst. You know, you can't see because of the sharing algorithm that they have in there, you might be spending a lot of time and effort trying to push out social media, but especially if you're in the crypto space and you can't boost posts, it doesn't necessarily make that much, effort, that much uh, reason to actually continue doing it. Now, once you have the data, that's where you can act, and then you can iterate. So you can take a campaign, you might start with 100 publishers, you whittle that down to 20, you focus the 20 there, you focus the budget there, and then you increase the volume as you go through. Now, when it comes to reports, Maths and ratios are really important. Like you're not talking very complex things, but you're talking basic ratios. And these help you identify different dropout points that you have there. So first thing you need to do is identify different data sources for different KPIs. So you might have a user registration database that has your user registration data. You might have login servers, so you need to track the people who have logged in. You've got payment gateways, all these different things, and then you might have some third-party tools then as well. So really being able to find out in your funnel what step relates to what KPI is really key. Now next you need to structure reports in a logical manner. So your report should start with a click. You've got a user registration. And going back to that exchange example, you need to see this user is registered. They've activated. They've logged in. They've gone through KYC. They've made deposits. They've made trades, the revenue that they've made. Once you have the integration done, you need to test that it works. And then once you're happy with it, you need to deploy it. Then once you have the tracking in place, you really need to start sending traffic. Now, we often work on the basis of that we'll take waves of users that we'll bring in. We might spend test campaigns of $500, $2,000, and bring in waves of users there as well. And we take that approach because we'll spend a few days bringing a burst of users in, check that the tracking's working, 
and then really iterate from there as well. If the tracking's broken, pause it, fix it, come back in. If we've got sources that are, aren't registering, we'll work from there as well. Once you have the data, then you need to read the reports, and then you need to feed back to the relevant departments. So in marketing, you've got different departments that you're working with. You've got your own team, you might have third-party stakeholders, you might have developers, you might have management there as well. And the data doesn't lie. Sometimes it shows very, very, very hideous, horrible stats that you're not happy with. But it's good to know that because at least you can act on it then as well. So once you have the improvements identified, so you can really work through them, you can deploy them, generate more traffic, read the reports again, and see what changes there's been. So often when we make a change, we'll see a specific date, a change got deployed, and then we might find, okay, well, the data for the following day has gone up 10, 15, 20%, or it's gone down, and that's where we'll actually know it's working. Once you verify the findings and improvements, you repeat and iterate. So having this data here is very powerful as well. Now in terms of how you can use this data to improve product design, so really what you want to do is generate lots of data over time, a couple of months, a couple of weeks, whatever it is that you want to do. So when you build a website often, and especially anyone who's working in the marketing department, you're going to really be working with what's been given to you. The developers will build something that they know, and they assume that it's going to be used the way that they think it is. But humans are very different. Feedback is really important. So once you have some data there, you can actually use that to get buy-in for development time. And if they don't know that something's broken because it's been buried in the actual product design, they won't act to fix it as well. Now, in crypto, you often have very complex multi-stage funnels. So it's really important to make sure that you're measuring each and every single step so you can identify where the problems are and then be able to narrow it down and actually fix that then as well. Some improvements are really simple. You can rework a landing page. You know, if it's an email activation thing, sometimes just changing the subject line can make a considerable and noticeable difference on people doing it. Some improvements are a lot more complex. So we've worked with clients where they had quite complex KYC or authentication, two-factor authentication, and the product actually needs quite an amount of re-engineering to actually get it working. Now, once you've implemented those changes, the results should be visible within a couple of days, which is pretty good. So good or bad. Now, if you see an improvement is dete detected, it makes it much easier the next time around when you're looking for a development time. And if it's not, you can always just roll back and see if that works. And ultimately, the more users you can get through the funnel, the more it will translate to users on the platform, and then this in turn can generate some more sales for you as well. Now, if you've done multiple improvements on a registration funnel and your sales don't go up, you can take the same approach when it comes to looking at the actual product database itself to identify if there's problems in there as well. So often we've seen like you've a super refined registration funnel, but then the actual monetization button for a particular project is buried six screens away from where it is. So just taking it out there and putting it in can make it very, uh, make a big difference there as well. So when it comes to the marketing team, you know, marketing teams have finite resources. You've got limited staff, you've got limited budget, or you've got limited time. You can expend quite a lot of effort, whether it's on copywriting or if you're doing lots of different banner sets on graphic design. And these can, you can often be spending on platforms that aren't generating any results. The information can be fed back into the marketing mix. So if you've got really strong data, you might take keyword data from ads, feed that back into content planning and SEO. You can also have multiple staff that can be measured. So when you're working across multiple social media platforms, now this can be a bit of a double-edged sword. We've had scenarios where you had three or four people who were working on a job, two of them came out really well, one of them didn't. But the likewise, we also saw a situation where somebody was looking after email and someone was looking after social media and they went on holiday and they swapped jobs. And the person who was doing email ended up being three times better at social media and the person who was doing social media ended up being three times better than the person doing email. So we used that information to actually swap their jobs around so that they were focused the right way. Now, also, when you're working with third-party agencies, you can measure these based on the results. You know, I run an agency. We have a lot of people who are saying, well, look, can you stand over your data there as well? And the thing is, if you don't have it, or it's scattered across 15 or 20 different uh, advertising reports, it can be very difficult. Whereas if you have all of your data in one particular report, it can be very easy to see if it worked or not. And really, that leads to transparency. You know, if something's working, you want to be able to know that it's working well. If something isn't working, you want to be able to know to cut it, repurpose it. Now, when it comes to looking at the reports to optimize advertising campaigns, 
You know, marketing, I've always heard, is one of the only departments that spends money. Everyone else in the business is going to have to look after making money for the business there as well. Once it's gone, it's gone. You might be given half a million dollars or $20,000 of a marketing budget, and it's use it or lose it. You know, if it's gone, it's gone. It's very hard for you to justify getting more money from a company when what's been done beforehand is blown. You also want to be able to measure that in terms of registration, product usage, sales, and return on advertising investment. Now, when you've got multiple networks that are going, these can often have many, many, many different traffic sources bed in. So if you don't have your report structured the right way, it can get very overwhelming to understand how it works. You can identify if there's an overall channel that's working for you really well. You can identify if there's individual traffic sources that are working well and get the true results and, and either focus budget or redistribute budget there. Now, this is a bit of a complex thing, but it's just to highlight how complex an advertising campaign can be at scale. So you start off with your company. You may then have an agency that's involved, and then you have different types of campaigns. So if you're running a direct deal, say with CoinMarketCap, you've only got one traffic source that's there as well. Now within that, you might then have different pages that you're focused on, but ultimately it's one website that the traffic's coming through. If you're working with affiliates, you have various different affiliate networks. You might have 20 or 30 different traffic sources from each of those affiliates that are coming in, and some of them might have sub-affiliates as well where they're reselling. You might have advertising networks. Within an advertising network, you could have hundreds uh, of publishers that are there. With programmatic, it gets even more complex. You might have thousands of traffic sources that are coming in. And then you've got multiple sub-traffic sources then as well. And some of these even have sub-sub-traffic sources. So we've seen in practice an advertising campaign can have 15 levels deep in terms of people who are hooked into the previous ones there as well. Now, if you're doing Google Ads, you've got various different types. So you've display campaigns which are running. These can potentially be running across hundreds of websites. If you've got search campaigns, these can be running across various different ad groups, and each of them have your different keywords. So being able to measure each of them individually is really important. You may have video campaigns, and you may be running at them on different channels, and sometimes they have sub-channels then as well, and also you've got them against different keywords. And again, different keyword campaigns that are there. And then you've got your remarketing campaigns, so these can be targeting different groups that you have. So in any particular campaign, you could be, you have traffic coming from either one website to several thousands. So being able to identify which specific traffic source is coming from that traffic from that website is really, really, really important. Because if you have this, like often we'd have like 12 or 15 different campaigns running concurrently, and we have hundreds and thousands of websites that are sending traffic through. But there could only be 40 or 50 of them that are really generating any meaningful return. So for us, it makes more sense for our clients to spend on those 40 websites and concentrate 80% of the budget there, maximize the volume that we can, and then downplay the traffic on the other ones because they're skewing the stats. Now, in terms of an example of how this works in practice, so we have a client who has a very complex seven-step conversion funnel. So this consisted of, they had a landing page which qualified the traffic that was coming through. They had a multi-step registration process. They had email activation, they had to set up two-factor authentication, people had to fill in personal data, they had to go through a KYC process with a third party, they had to accept the program terms and conditions, and then after that point then, that's when they could actually start to apply for the actual product itself as well. So by using a high standard of tracking and accreditation, we're able to identify the metrics between the different goals. Now, look at these individually. So with the landing pages, we were able to look at each of the landing pages and redesign them. So the first thing that we did was to turn them into a cul-de-sac or a dead-end road, so that the only route that people had was to either go back or to go through the registration funnel, instead of giving them lots of different options to go off back to the website and back in. We then did a couple of different variants of these, so we had different, you know, the different layouts, different colors, different background images, and then we use A-B testing to focus traffic on the best performing pages there as well. So this is where Google Optimize can come in very handy. Once we had that then, with the registration process, we worked with them to reduce the number of input fields. So we, locked, we got rid of about 20% of the input fields so it was easier. And we rearranged the actual order in which these were filled in to make them more intuitive for end users. The next thing with the email activation, so we implemented DKIM authentication on their mail server. So they were getting a big issue with their activation emails were getting hit by spam filters. 
So by getting this in place, it improved the, the numbers going through as well. We also rearranged the subject lines and relayed out the contents in those activation emails. And that change alone, which took 20 minutes and a bit of development time, increased overall numbers getting from registration to activation by 6%. So when you've got that on 10 or 20,000 users, that adds up. The next thing that we had was we identified that the two-factor authentication step that they had in their process was killing it. They had over 30% of users who were getting to that point who just did not continue. So what we did was we identified that, it was a recurring issue, and then we've actually got them to remove that from their registration process. So they've moved it into the actual product itself as an option, but they stopped it being uh, enforced there as well. We also had a look at re rearranging how the personal data was collected and the KYC process that they had with their third party as well. So at the time, people would have to register, go through KYC, maybe wait 20 minutes for that to be processed, wait for an e email to come back in. But we worked with them and their tech team to improve that so that it could be done in two minutes and the KYC would continue in the background there as well. That change itself, that one change with KYC improved the amount of people getting through that step by 35% overnight. So really, with doing this as well, so we had the data, we built it up, we brought enough traffic coming through. We worked with their marketing department who kind of uh, worked with us to be able to highlight this. We worked with their product management teams and we worked with their development teams. Now, overall, between all these different steps that we had, we improved for, by 40% the amount of people going through end to end in their process. And this led to over 20% increase in sales from the same marketing spend. So it's much easier for us then to be able to focus, ask for more budget, bring more people through, and maximize that coming through as well. Now, in addition, we were able to reduce the number of campaigns that we were running. So we, I think we started off with 12 or 13 different advertising networks and channels that we were using originally. Through using this data, we could see over half of them weren't really worth any spend. So we cut them as well. So that made huge amounts of savings in terms of time, reporting, budget, hassle, the whole shebang. So, just in terms of wrapping up, I uh, appreciate you coming here and listening to the thing. Uh, if you want to get in touch, we have a booth in the hall. Um, we have an offer where if you sign up, you can get an hour's free consultancy from the 11th of November when we get back in. And we have two very tasty bottles of Irish Teenings whiskey. So there's going to be a draw at 4 p.m. today and another one at tomorrow. And there are the rest of our contact details there as well. So appreciate anyone's, everyone's time. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. And if not, thank you very much for your time. So. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, okay. So within Facebook and crypto, you've got an advertising ban. So the, you know, if they detect that you're crypto, they're not really gonna do it. Now Facebook by design is designed in a way that they have a sharing algorithm. So if you want to spend money, sorry, if you wanna do your organic activities on Facebook, and then you, know, you put out a post to 20,000 people, it's only gonna get shown to one or 2%. And then depending on how they react, that's gonna get shown to another few percent and a few percent and a few. And that's by design so that they can force you to boost posts. But in crypto, you can't boost the posts. So, you know, you can be expending equal amounts of effort between, you know, say, Medium for blogging, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube as well. And because you have that advertising ban in there that you can't boost the posts, Facebook, you know, ends up being, you know, you're expending a lot of time and effort to manage a Facebook page, and there's very few of your actual organic fans seeing that activities. And you can see that from the results. You know, you might have like, you know, literally three or four times less traffic coming from those activities. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to stop using that channel, um, you know, but you might switch around your efforts so you focus, say, 40% of your time on Twitter, 40% of your time on another channel, and then only 20% of your time instead of equally spending them there as well. So, but it boils down to the crypto ban. So, any other questions? No? Okay. Look, thank you very much, everyone.